Uh, yeah, so shall I start? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So in this presentation, we'll be looking at Z2 maps, what they are and how they can um, give some reformulation and some proof for some non-embeddability results. So we'll be looking at two main um, results. I'll briefly describe one of them now. So we have seen how the Borzo Coulomb theorem in particular tells us that there can be no continuous map F from ST to RD. Right? Because we know that there will be a pair of antipodes which get mapped to the same point. So now, so ST is the boundary of the of the D plus one, the D plus one dimensional ball. And this is homeomorphic to the D plus one simplex. So ST is homeomorphic to the boundary of this simplex. So what Borzo Coulomb theorem is telling us is that if you have a map from this boundary to RD, then F cannot be injective. So our theorem, the topological Radon theorem, it gives us some um, extra information on which two points would be getting mapped to the same thing. So what it says is if you have a map F from sigma D plus one to RD, continuous map, then there is a pair of disjoint faces in sigma D plus one whose images intersect. So it's not just that some two points will be getting mapped to the same thing, they will, but they will also come from, but there will be some pair of points coming from disjoint faces. And um, so here, this, this statement has uh, sigma d plus one in it. So it's speaking about sigma d plus one rather than a map of its boundary, but it doesn't make a difference because um, here neither f1, f nor f2 can be the whole simplex sigma d plus one itself because otherwise these wouldn't be disjoint. So as an example, uh, in the case d equals one, um, the boundary of sigma d plus one or sigma two becomes the boundary of this triangle. And so what this theorem is telling us is that any map from here to R1 for any map, um, there will be some vortex of the triangle whose image gets mapped onto the image of the opposite side. Um, so we will be looking at a proof of this later, but before that we need to build some, um, some terminology and some machinery. So we'll do that now. Um, so the first topic is Z2 spaces and Z2 maps. Um, right. So we say that a pair X nu is a Z2 space. If um, So X is a topological space here. Nu from X to X is a homeomorphism such that nu applied twice gives you the identity on X. And in this case, we call nu the Z2 action on X. So this is essentially giving us a way to uh, generalize or to find an analog of the notion of antipodes that we have for spheres. So on spheres, SN, we have this map that sends X to minus X. It's a homeomorphism. And if you apply it twice, you get identity. Um, so that's just generalizing. So this definition of Z2 space is generalizing that to a wider class of spaces. Similarly, RN is a Z2 space with the same map X going to minus X. We say that nu is free if nu of x is not equal to x for all points x. So now this is a generalization of antipodes. We want to generalize antipodal maps also. And the analogs of those are called Z2 maps. So a Z2 map is a continuous map between two Z2 spaces, x nu, y omega, such that f commutes with the Z2 action. So, um, basically f of nu of x is omega of f of x for any point x. So yeah, think of the definition of antipodal maps. Um, there we wanted f of minus x to be minus of f of x. So it, it's just, this is just restating that in um, a new language, sort of. Uh, right, so let's look at a few examples of Z2 spaces. If you have any topological space x, you can give a Z2 action to X cross X that just exchanges its coordinates to X1, X2 gets mapped to X2, X1. You can, um, and it's, you can very naturally extend the definitions of Z2 spaces, Z2 actions to simplicial complexes. Um, so suppose K is a simplicial complex and nu is a map from its vertex set to itself. We say that nu is a Z2 action on K if its induced affine map is a Z2 action on 
the polyhedron of K and nu is free if its induced affine map is free. Um, so before uh, moving on to some more examples, we'll just note uh, a small fact here, which we'll need later. So if K is a simplicial Z2 complex and nu, the Z2 action is free on K, then for all simplices F and K, F and nu of F do not intersect. Uh, why? So we look at a proof of this. Um, so first we'll show that F is not equal to nu of F. Why? Because, um, so if F were equal to nu of F, it would be like, um, so nu would be permuting the vertices of F. But in that case, the barycenter of F would be getting mapped to itself, uh, which would contradict uh, nu uh, being free. So we must have F not equal to nu of F. So just a small doubt, when you say that some space is a, a free Z2 space or free new space, in that case, you are taking the action on the, I mean, uh, are you taking the action on the simplicial complex or on the line underlying space? Okay, just go back on to the underlying yeah, one yeah. slide back. So, okay, huh. I Fine. yes, yeah. Fine. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So um, yeah. So if if the vertices of F are getting permuted, the barycenter would be getting mapped to the same thing under the affine map. So um, nu would not be free. So now we'll show that F and nu of F do not intersect. Also, so suppose that they did intersect at some F prime, say. Um, so now we know from part one that nu does not permute the vertices of F prime among itself. So then, so here in this intersection, there must be some vertex B um, such that nu of F lies outside of this intersection. And so we know that nu inverse of V comes from F and nu of V lies in nu of F. So that means we know its pre-image lies in F outside of this intersection and its image lies in nu of F outside of this intersection. So that means, so these two points must be different. But that is a contradiction because new uh, composed with itself gives you identity. So it's pre-image and the image must be same for all points. So that gives us a contradiction. And so F and new F cannot intersect. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I want to look at a couple more examples of Z2 spaces, but we need to make, uh, we need to define the join of two spaces also before that. Um, so for two topological spaces A and B, they are joined, denoted by A star B. Um, so intuitively, it can be thought of as the space which you get by taking one copy of A, one copy of B, and joining everything in A to everything in B by line segments. For example, if you have, if one of your sets is the circle S1 and um, one set is your singleton, just a singleton set, their join would be a cone. So in the join A star B, to uh, specify a point in this space, um, you need to specify which line segment it lies on and how far along that line segment it lies. So we do this, to do this, we use a, a triple um, A, B, T, where A and B are the endpoints of this line segment and T comes from this unit uh, interval. And it's for telling us how far along we are on this line segment. But um, so, but we'll denote this point by uh, using this notation. Okay. Um, right. And for a space A, its n fold join with itself is denoted by A star um, n. So we'll look at a couple of examples of joins. Um, so let's look at the join S not star S not. Um, right. So here, so we need to take two copies of S not. So here I've shown one copy in green and the other copy in um, purple. And the pink lines are for showing the, the line segments. Are, well, here I've curved them out a little, but the line segments joining them. And hopefully from this diagram, it's clear why this is um, S1. Similarly, if you look at S0 star S1, then here I've shown one copy of S1 in um, purple and S0 in green. Um, yeah. And again, the pink is for showing the line segments between them. and. Yeah, so this is homeomorphic to S2. So 
here what i've done is i've i've embedded s1 in the first so the xy the horizontal xy plane so the first two coordinates in s2 i've i've used and s0 in the um, vertical plane uh, vertical axis so the the last coordinate i've used um and similarly here i've one copy of s0 was in the horizontal axis one copy of s0 was along the vertical axis um, so the first co first coordinate and last coordinate in general we have sm star sn is homeomorphic to sm plus n plus 1 and you can see this in a similar way so you can identify sm with so you can embed it in the first n plus 1 coordinates of this bigger sphere and sn in the last n plus 1 coordinates um okay so right, going back to examples of z2 spaces um if you have two z2 spaces x nu and y omega you can give a z2 action to their join x star y we'll call this action as new star uh, new star omega so what you do is you take a point in the join and you sort of um you apply new to x and omega to y individually so it just that gives you a z2 action on it um Similarly, if you have two z2 spaces from say x to w and y to z, then you have a z2 map between x star y and w star z. Um, so again, what you do is you apply f. You take a point. You apply f to x, g to y individually. In addition to this, similar to how we had the exchange of coordinates for Cartesian product of a topological space. If you have a z2 space x, you can equip x star x with a z2 action that is similar to the exchange of coordinates u yeah. okay so right so now we will look at um, the z2 index so for a space for two spaces x and y we write this if there is a z2 map from x to y and this if there isn't so uh, we we'll look at so a lot of the proofs that we we'll look at eventually they'll come down to showing that a z2 map does not exist between a pair of spaces okay so if there is a z2 space uh, z2 map from x to y in some sense y is bigger than x and um, we'll see what that means in a in a minute the bolzo coulomb theorem tells us precisely that there is no z2 map from sn to sn minus 1 because um in this case we know that so z2 maps for spheres they correspond exactly to um, uh, antipodal maps So, and we know that no such map exists so now um the z2 index gives some measure z2 index of a space x gives some measure of how big x is and it's defined as um the minimum n such that there is a z2 map going from x to sn so here yeah, to to uh, z2 index is useful in in seeing whether a z2 map exists between a pair of spaces and so we look at some properties of the index now first one is that index of sn is equal to n why because uh, from borzo coulomb theorem we know that index of sn cannot be less than n um because there will be no z2 map to a smaller sphere and definitely identity map from sn to itself gives you a z2 map so index must be exactly n the next one um if there is a z2 map from x to y Then the index of y must be at Ashita, least as big as. I think we can skip these. These okay. are uh, so pretty I'll... obvious from the uh, definition of the index itself. Okay, so maybe I'll, you can just uh... go through the second uh, property if at all you want. First, uh, third, yeah. and zeroth are obvious, right? Yeah. Okay. Fine. I'll. Uh, fine. Yeah. Okay. So right, and this fine. So this second one. um and this is so it goes back to what i was saying about y being bigger than x in a sense okay third one on uh, this one is giving some bound on the index of a join index of x star y is less than equal to index of x plus index of y plus 1 and basically the reason comes down to this fact that we'd seen earlier okay the fourth one um if x is n minus 1 connected then its index is greater than equal to n um so i'll i'll briefly go through uh, at, uh, at some definition of n connectedness at least um okay 
So we say that a space is n-connected if its first n homotopy groups are trivial. So we've seen the first homotopy group um, or the fundamental group. It consists of homotopy classes of loops centered at a point. Um, similarly, the nth homotopy group, all right, yeah, so loop centered at a point. A loop can be thought of as a map from S1 to the space X. So similarly, the nth homotopy group is consists of homotopy classes of continuous maps from Sn to X. Now, the first homotopy group is trivial if all loops are contractible. And so for any loop uh, in X, here I've shown purple, there'll be some homotopy sending it, contracting it to the constant map going to X naught. And we can use this homotopy to extend this map um, F to a map going from B2 to X. Um, similarly, in, in, for the, in the general case, uh, this nth homotopy group pi n of X is trivial if every map from Sn to X is contractible. If every such map is contractible, we can extend every such map to a map from Bn plus one to X. Okay. So, um, and the reason I mentioned this is because uh, it's, okay, so we'll see it in, in the proof. Yeah. So we want to show that index of X is at least as big as N. Basically, what we'll do is we'll construct a Z2 map from S into X. Um, yeah. And, okay, so I'll, I'll skip this proof for now because uh, just to make sure we go on, go through the later topics as well. Um, but so for now, just take this result for granted. If X is N minus one connected, then there's a Z2 map from S into X. The last property, um, if K is a free n-dimensional Z2 simplicial complex, then its index is less than or equal to n. And um, the proof for this is- one side, one slide? Yeah, yeah. So uh, this shouldn't be hard to see, right? If X is n minus yeah, so one connected, which means that it's n minus one -th homotopy group is zero which means any map from Sn minus one to X can be extended to a map from Dn to X. And then yeah. you can yeah. consider the restriction of that particular map to its boundary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. and yes, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, and so, Right, and, and for for um, this next property, the again, the idea is very simple. It's just, so this time we are giving an upper bound on the index of K rather than a lower bound as was before, but, um, hang on. Yeah, so it, it's very similar. So um, here you kind of built up from, you gave maps from um, smaller S spheres to X and you, use them to build up until you reached Sn to X. What you'll do here is you'll have maps from the K skeleton of K and you'll keep doing that until you hit the um, N skeleton or uh, skeleton of K. Okay, so the idea is very similar. Um, so yeah, I, I'll skip this proof for now then and we we'll move on. So, um, okay. So, now we'll start moving towards a proof for the topological Radon okay. theorem. <clears throat> so let's uh, recall what the statement was. It said that for any continuous map F from sigma D plus one to RD, there is some pair of disjoint faces whose images are, whose images intersect. So this is equivalent to saying that, so if this happens, there must be a point X1 in F1, X2 in F2, which get mapped to the same thing. and since they come from disjoint faces, their supports will be disjoint. Okay, so to prove this, we want a more convenient way to phrase these conditions. So suppose call K uh, uh, to be the boundary of sigma D plus one. Um, we want to exclude all maps from K to RD such that F of X1 is not equal to F of X2 for all X1, X2 with disjoint supports. Those are the maps we don't want. So We'll, right. We call such maps as bad maps. We want to show that there exist no bad maps. 
let x be this set of pairs x1 x2 um, whose supports are disjoint so we want to exclude maps where this holds for all x1 x2 in capital x what happens if we have a bad map if we have a bad map we know that no point y comma y is in the image of x so we know that um, a bad map f pair from x to y uh, sorry a bad map f from k to rd um, gives us a map f pair from x to y which we can define as um, so it should be given by f f pair of x comma y will be given by f of x comma f of y and we know that if such a map is if f is bad then x gets mapped to this set um, where y consists of um, pairs y1 y2 where y1 is not equal to y2 so if we show that no such map between x and y exists then we know that no map no such map between k and rd exists so the good thing is we've gotten rid of our badness condition that we had earlier because we've absorbed it in the definitions of x and y but this condition that f pair is not equal to f comma f for some f it's it's still tricky to handle so we'll try to find some weaker condition that we can look at instead um right so right so note that here we were giving f pair by this coordinate wise by f what happens if you swap x and y here you the result is that f of x and f of y get swapped here in other words if you equip x and y with these z2 action given by an exchange of coordinates then this map f pair is actually a z2 map between them so a bad map from k to rd gives us a z2 map from x to y so as soon as we show that there is no z2 map from x to y then we are done okay um so the deleted products name uh, so in general for a space z its deleted product is defined to be z cross z minus this diagonal um so here you see that y is the deleted product of rd itself um okay so right so we want to show that there is no z2 map from x to y so we need so one way to do this is to show index of y is strictly less than index of x um right so we'll try to find some bounds on the indices so we will show that um there is a z2 map from y to s d minus 1 so which will imply that index of y is less than or equal to d minus 1 uh, what is this map it's given by y1 comma y2 getting sent to this um, unit vector in y1 minus y2 direction is it is it a z2 map yes because if you swap coordinates here what you get here is minus of what you had so it's a z2 map and so index is less than or equal to d minus 1 so it will be enough to show that index of x is greater than or equal to d um right so but um here with this deleted product construction this um formulation is is nice and it's it almost gets us the answer but the only problem is that um the structure of x the space x is still a bit tricky to handle so here i i had um i had this here we had a diagram to show that it gets complicated even for very small values of d um i illustrated this in the case of d equals 1 but for now i'll i'll skip over this and we can come back to it later if necessary basically uh, just is that um the space x is still gets tricky to handle so what we do is we instead turn to a, a new construction that of deleted joins our ideas and our approach to the problem will remain the same but it's just um, deleted joins will turn out to be easier to handle than um, deleted products so if k is a simplicial complex um it's deleted join um so you think of this as uh, taking two copies of k and you take a simplex f1 here and f2 here so you're joining all pairs of simplices which do not intersect so and so this simplex will be denoted by f1 <coughs> plus f2 um f1 and f2 are disjoint so here are a couple of examples to illustrate how this deleted join is different from the usual join uh, if you have a singleton set um sigma not then its usual join would consist of a line segment with two end points right but in the deleted join you don't have this line segment because you just have the end points because you are deleting the lines joining 
simplices with it with themselves so you just have the endpoints similarly for a two point set it's its join with itself consists of four line segments but its deleted join has only two line segments because you've deleted these two okay um right so um for uh, the proof of topological radon theorem we will show that we'll reduce it to showing that there is no z2 map between a certain pair of space uh, certain deleted joins so for that we need to be able to um, compute deleted joins of simplicial complexes um right so we have this lemma here let k and l be simplicial complexes then deleted join of k star l is join of deleted joins of k and l so deleted join commutes with join in in a sense so to see this roughly um look at a simplex here um a simplex here is of the form um f1 u plus g1 and f2 u plus g2 where both of these are coming from k star l and these two must be disjoint that happens if and only if f1 and f2 are disjoint in k and g1 and g2 are disjoint in l um so the corresponding simplex that you have here on the right side is f1 u plus f2 and g1 u plus g2 why because um f1 and f2 are disjoint in k so this simplex lies in this deleted join and similarly this lies in this deleted join so just yeah roughly this is why um they are the same um last uh, as a corollary of this um uh, we can say that for the n simplex sigma n its deleted join is homeomorphic to sn so um for this we we write sigma n as um n plus 1 fold join of sigma not with itself right? because so sigma not is just one point and to get sigma 1 you so what you do is you take two points you join everything here add one point join everything here and so on you keep doing this until you get n plus 1 vertices so this is like sigma n fold n plus 1 fold join of sigma not with itself so so that's what we use we write sigma n as um so we write it in terms of sigma not then we use the previous lemma to interchange this these two um deleted join and join so inside the bracket we have deleted join of sigma not which we've seen is two a two point set which is homeomorphic to s not and n plus 1 fold join of s not with itself is sn so we get a result yeah so yeah so after this uh, krishna will continue with these deleted joins and complete the proof of topological radon theorem and take it from there um yeah that's what i had so uh, can i go over this example then uh, briefly yeah. okay so yeah so here i was just well i just copied a diagram from the textbook for um, to illustrate the case d equals 1 in the case of deleted products um right so there we had um um y consisted of pairs in r2 with y1 not equal to y2 um and um so yeah k was the boundary of the two simplex so that's the boundary of the triangle and we know this is homeomorphic to s1 so k cross k is homeomorphic to s1 cross s1 and in a similar way that you visualize uh, s1 cross s1 as taking one circle and rotating it around a larger circle similarly you can visualize k cross k as you take a smaller triangle and you rotate it around a larger triangle um and so x lies in here x is consists of all the pairs um with disjoint supports um which here has been shown in this uh, um uh, bold line black line so it turns out that x is actually homeomorphic to s1 um yeah and so in that case we know that its index is equal to 1 which is greater than index of y which we know is 1 minus 1 which is 0 so yeah so in that case we were actually able to conclude this but it's just for even bigger values of d x gets even more tricky to handle so that's why we don't do deleted joins and not the deleted product construction um yeah so yeah that's all i all i had for today <laughs>